Well, praise God. I find myself in a position similar to Wednesday night when I had, a, had thoughts and a burden and no organization at all. And praise God, that's all right. That's the way the Lord wants it. Then you're just going to get something disorganized. That's all there is to it. But um, I, let me start by just saying this. There's something about human nature and there's something about the way we think of the Christian life and of church, quote unquote, that tends to beget a lot of pretense of, um, I don't, I'm going to stop short of hypocrisy because I think a lot of it is not intentional in that sense. But it's that we, we learn how to, uh, I mean, we have the idea of what it means to be a Christian and a church member, and it's this happy, happy, you know, free, victorious kind of thing. And the reality is the Christian life is not that clean and neat. It's very messy sometimes. And we are very much in a process of the Lord doing something that oftentimes gets very deep. And so, you know, many times we find, up, we find ourselves coming in and putting on our game face. And we, uh, you know, we want to, uh, we certainly don't want anybody to see that there's anything lacking in us. And so we just, you know, we, we put on something that really doesn't relate to where we're at. And it's not that I think the Lord wants us to wallow in, uh, you know, how bad we are and how bad things are. But at the same time, I believe that there's, I sense the Lord wanting us to be more authentic. And... Uh, and he's, he's longing for us to just come to a place where we can be ourselves. You know, I, I referred to what something Jack had said, Jack Bureau had said in our men's meeting down there, and how the Lord had brought him to a place where he realized he didn't have to be something he wasn't. He could just, with the Lord, he could just be himself. And that was good, and that was, that was okay, and the Lord was, you know, the Lord was all right with that. We don't have to pretend. But, you know, a lot of times we come into the service, and we're, you know, we're really going through something on the inside and we're struggling. But we smile and somebody down the row is looking at us and saying, oh my God, I'm struggling and look at them. You know, and you're looking at each other and each one is, is having their challenges and their struggles. And, uh, you know, it's not incompatible with the truths that we, that we pr profess because it's possible to be in the middle of a struggle in the storm and yet paradoxically have, have a peace and a joy that we, can, that we can actually genuinely claim and genuinely move in. So, uh, I don't know, part of it is related to that, and part of it is related to what I tried to express a little bit on, on Wednesday, and that is that the root of everything in our relationship begins with our relationship with the Lord. If we get that down, if we begin to, to move in that, if we begin to understand what it is that he wants of us, what he's looking for from us, and we begin to be authentic with the Lord, I believe it's going to spill out into our relationships with one another and our, and our relationship and, our, and our, what we project to the world because, you know, you, you think about it, if we're, if we're struggling and people sense that we're struggling but we're still doing this, it just, it kind of almost presents a false, you know, hey, they're just being hypocrites, so they're not being real, or this, is, there's, this isn't real. And I believe God wants it to be, wants everything about us to be genuine and authentic. And I believe it can be in Him. And we can, we can learn to be honest, we can, you know, we're going to see a lot of fruit, I believe, if, we, if God brings us to the point that I'm, I'm sort of envisioning, there's going to be a lot less judgmentalism among us. We're going to have a lot more compassion. We see this in, in measure. I thank God for the degree to which we've seen it. Where we can, instead of looking down on somebody who is in a, is in a difficult place, we can have a compassion because we know what we are. We know what God has saved us from. We've been there, done that. And uh, we're here to help each other, to encourage each other, to receive each other as God does where we're at and to, and to help for him to bring us along. But the thing that I was thinking about so much Wednesday, and I'll just go over the, some, of the, some of it and then get to, to where I want to get and the, the thoughts that I've had since. And it had to do with walking with the Lord and how many times we've seen in the scriptures where there, the Lord made special reference to Enoch was a prime example. Enoch walked with God. Very simple statement. But there's a profoundness 
to that that I think we miss because we are, I guarantee every one of us is, is, has a degree of this. We, we tend to think, of, we didn't tend to compartmentalize our lives. There's our spiritual life. And most particularly, there's that life that we want to sort of step into between 10 o'clock and, 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 and noon on Sunday. And then, okay, now we got that over with. Now we get back to, to our regular life. And I believe with all my heart, God wants our life to be all the same. He, wants our, he doesn't want that kind of a distinction that we make where, okay, Lord, I'm going to spend time with you. And, and we equate that with activity, spiritual activity, duty almost at times. And we, we've, now we've done that. Now we're going to leave his presence in a sense. And we're going to go do our stuff as though he's not really interested in our stuff. If I've got to study for a test, well, I mean, you know, there's nothing spiritual about that. I, you know, I can say, oh, God, help me, but he's not, you know, to sit there and look over my shoulder and actually share that with me. Or, uh, you know, let's go get some ice cream. Just imagine, imagine for a moment that Jesus is actually walking with us, quite literally. And we get up in the morning and we say, all right, Jesus, how do you, uh, Lord, how do you like your eggs? And uh, the coffee pot's over there. And then we, you know, we, we chit-chat and we talk about the day's news. And, and you know, we encourage, he encourages us. And then we, we get in the car and say, don't forget to fasten your seatbelt. And, and we go off to our daily activities. And we confront the, the normal things that we do every single day and find out that he is intimately interested in sharing every part of our lives. You know, how many of you remember, uh, oh, several years ago now, Jim Petrie talking about, and he's, I, I don't know, it's something to do with a handyman type of thing. He was trying to solve a, a problem. I guess it had to do with carpentry or something. I don't remember the details now, but he was kind of perplexed. And instead of saying, you know, instead of Googling it, or instead of, uh, you know, calling some expert, he just sort of, you know, Lord, how do I, how do I handle this? What, what do I do with this? And, and he just thought about it and rested, and, and all of a sudden the Lord just, it's just like something came into his mind. And he could seek and visualize a solution to what he was trying to do, and he just moved in that. You know, that's the kind of a God we have. I mean, you think about the joy that it brought to the Lord's heart to share the life that he had with Enoch. And how, how blessed he was. I mean, he made us as objects of his love, but to fellowship and to have, to have someone to share. I mean, didn't he come down to the garden and, uh, and, and go looking, even after he knew what had happened, he came down looking, reaching out to, for fellowship with, with Adam. Adam, where are you? I mean, it's, it's, it's incomprehensible to us that the God of the universe, who's got all of this to manage, so, so to speak, we, we project ourselves onto him and think he's like us, that he would actually be interested in the smallest details of our everyday lives. That he does not make any kind of distinction between the, the ordinary and the spiritual in that sense. That he's, he's not really interested. You know, if you're cooking, how do I do this? If you're working on your homework or if you're working on your job or, you know, we've got some electricians here and I'm sure they run into problems. You know, the Lord's interested in those things. He cares about every detail, and he, he longs for us to just be in that relationship where it's not like, okay, Lord, I know you're somewhere. I'm going to come back into your presence. But he never leaves, and we never leave, and we live, and we learn to walk. It's, it's more, it's not an event. It's more like a way of thinking and a way of living where we just realize the Lord is a part of every part of my life, every part of my life. And the more we learn to think that way, the more we can just spend time with him. Now, of course, you know, that, that raises issues. Are there places that we go and things that we do where we just would be uncomfortable if he came along? Something to think about. But at the same time, I, you know, I think we can get so spiritual. Or, or what we do is, is kind of have a religious view of the Lord, as though he's only interested in religious things. And if I spend all day with him, all we're going to talk about is the Bible. He doesn't care about the weather or how the fish are biting or, or, you know, Jesus was a carpenter. He didn't spend all his time discussing the intricacies of the law and the Old Testament and the, 
and all of that stuff. He, you know, was dealing with everyday people and, and fixing, fixing stuff for people and helping them. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't like he was doing this spiritual religious stuff all the time. It was just living an authentic life with, in fellowship with the Lord and nothing between. You know, I remember a song that was often sung when I was growing up, usually sung as a solo, I guess, nothing between my soul and the master. And I believe that's what the Lord desires. I sense his desire for me. And I sense that there's, there's areas of, of our lives that we need to just, we, we need to come into a place like this. Noah was another one. You know, Joel referred to this the other night. That It also says this of Noah, that he was a man who walked with God in his generation. And I'll tell you, if we're going we're gonna to go forward in the Lord, we're going to need to learn how to walk with him in this dark age because we're in a similar, a parallel time to what happened in the days of Noah. The world as a whole is hardening its heart and turning its back upon God. I mean, has not this country of ours defied, openly defied God? Yeah. What are we going to do? We're going to stand and trust God, and, and there's going to be a distinction that's going, we're going to see in the, in the days and years and however long there is to come. We're going to, God's going to make that, but I want to be one who just, my relationship, my citizenship is there. I'm here as a foreigner. My Lord is there, but he's also here with me because he's promised never to leave me, never to forsake me. But I don't want to live my life as though, okay, God, I'm going to do my stuff now. And then I'm going to, I'm going to, I got this duty mentality. Okay, I've got to read my Bible. That's, okay, I've done that. I got to pray, all right. You know, and prayer becomes a, a scheduled activity, a duty, instead of just constantly, Lord, I can talk to you any moment. There, there, we've, I've never left your presence. I'm just here, Lord, help me with this, or Lord... You know, I believe with all my heart, God wants to teach us and wants us to learn from him. Did, he not, did Jesus not invite us? He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. So there's the, there's the relationship that gets established when we let go and just, you know, come to him. But then it's take my yoke and learn from me. And I was thinking about the disciples. That was very, very real and very, very practical. They were not walking with someone they couldn't see. They were walking with a real flesh and blood man. They didn't just talk about God. They, they ate together. They walked. When they were hungry and walking through the fields, they picked the grain and, and ate it. And, and uh, he just did all And they went fishing. I mean, they did all kinds of things. And, and they went to a wedding on one occasion. When they ran out of wine, he took care of the problem. I mean, there was, he was just intimately interested and involved in their lives and, and they, when they walked, I'm sure there were many times they looked and they came in situations and, and they were able to look at Jesus and, and, and in a sense say, Jesus, how do we handle this? Or else they would, they would charge ahead and he would help them to see how they needed to handle it. Like, you know, remember when they went through the Samaria that one time and the Samaritans rejected him because he looked like he was going to Jerusalem. And uh, so the disciples said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire? Uh, as, as Elijah did, he said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. The son, son of man didn't come to, to destroy lives, but to save. And so there was a teachable moment. Do you know we, our lives are full of teachable moments? If, we will, if we're actually living in his presence and, and have this sense that, Lord, I'm, I'm here. I, I need you to help me and teach me. I mean, I was thinking about this. We, we think almost like teaching it's just something that happens from the pulpit. It's kind of a lecture. I mean, here we are in a lecture format. I, you know, for what it is, that's where we're at. I don't know the Lord can help us. But nonetheless, there's a place for, for teaching in this sense. And certainly they sat and they listened to Jesus' words. But the greatest teaching is living. And because it's not just about knowledge that we accumulate in our heads. It's about handling life in a godly way. How does, how does, a, son, how does a child of God live in, an un, in a broken world? And not only that, we live in bodies that still are in harmony with the broken world. And, and, we, and our place is to learn how to live the new life and let the old life go and let it die. We've got a lot of challenges, folks, and they're real. Yes. And they get messy, as I say sometimes. And the Lord is longing for us to just 
open our hearts. And I, I see, uh, well, I was, I was starting to say this, this business of teaching is not just lecture. It's not just Googling stuff. If, let me pick something, for example. I, I am not particularly uh, skilled with woodwork. I remember surviving a shop class when I was in junior high, and I managed to make a pair of bookends that didn't fall over. But that's not my skill set. I, I've never really particularly learned, and I, I guess I admire it and all of that. But if I wanted to learn how to do something that really required some, some skill, how would I best go about that? Read a book? Listen to a lecture? No. I would sit side by side with a master, somebody who really knows how to do that. And I, probably I'd watch him do it to start with. But then he would, be, he would be right there guiding my every step. Okay, now what do I do? How do I do this? And no, do it this way. You know, there would be a one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship to help me through that, to help me learn that. That's what God is looking for us, looking and wants to give us in our spiritual lives. I mean, how many times are we in situations where, you know, we, we interact with somebody and the wrong thing comes out again? Now, none of you have this problem, I, I understand. But you know, I believe that the Lord wants us to be in a, in a relationship with him where, you know, right there we realize he's there and we can just say, Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't handle that right. Please forgive me. But Lord, show me what's going on here. Help me to understand why I did, why I reacted that way, and how you would handle it, and how, you know, what's the answer to this? Lord, I need you to teach me. Didn't uh, David is certainly an example of someone who walked with God. Now, there was that one major lapse in his life, but I mean, the, the overall, the overriding description of his life is somebody who saw God not as a threatening lawgiver somewhere that I've got to somehow please and, and, and get accepted by what I do, but he saw him as an intimate friend. He saw him as somebody who cared for him like a, a shepherd cares for a sheep and was always there with him, always there looking after him and concerned about his about his every need and, and someone that he could talk to and someone that he didn't just have to go to when everything was great. He could go to him at his worst moments. And, uh, but, but you remember how many times in the, in the Psalms you will, you will see David reaching up and say, teach me, Lord. I mean, the very fact that he would do that, is that not an admission? God, I don't know. Every day I run into stuff that I don't know how to handle. I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand my own reactions, let alone what's going on around me. God, you know everything. And I want to be like you. I want to please you. I, I need help here. And, I'm, and I want you to teach me. But you know, if we're listening and, we're, and we take that humble posture before God, there's a God who wants to help us understand the things that we're going through. So it's not like... We're just struggling, and, and, and then, then later on we look back. But I tell you, there's a God who wants to be right there in the moment. And I'll tell you, what, one of the things that we struggle with, we are so proud by nature, and we're so performance-oriented that when we, when we get that sense, I've messed up, that's not exactly the time where we, we're looking over and, and, and feeling comfortable that Jesus is right there. We sort of hope that he's not looking right at that, that moment so we can kind of fix it and clean ourselves up a little bit. And then we, feel, then we can go back to feeling comfortable. And I see enough smiles to where I know that this is, I'm not the only one that's ever felt this, but this is, this is our nature. And the problem is we have got it exactly backwards exactly backwards. We can come in here and sing just as I am and in, in vague general terms we can say yeah that's right. Yeah thank God we can come just as we are until, it get, until we get in a place where we feel particularly 
dirty and have failed and feel like, oh my God. And then suddenly we have to feel like we've got to do penance of some sort. Instead of saying, Lord, here I am. It is what it is. Lord, help me. I'm sorry. But Lord, I know that, I know that you love me. We, we just, we struggle with the idea that God could love us at that moment. When we feel like we're struggling. When we feel like we have just said and done the wrong thing with the wrong attitude. Oh my God, this is a, this is just a, a condition. There's a weakness here. I don't, I did it again. I was trying all my best not to do it. Oh God. Getting quiet. But oh, I, I, the Lord so longs to teach us so many lessons. And among them are that we don't have to qualify for his love. His, his salvation is not about his telling us how we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act and we're supposed to try to be that somehow in our own strength. And if we aren't, then we just feel like we've messed up and how could he love us? There's so many issues that, that just come into this. And uh, I just, I sense God's heart. I mean, I just tasted a little bit in the last few days. It's like the Lord's trying to, trying to open my eyes a little bit more in this area. Because there's, there's just reactions that we have that are built into our nature. And God wants us to feel, to, to know that he knows. He's aware. I mean, I, let me get right down to it. Guys, you know, some attractive girl walks by. And the way she's dressed, you know she wants you to, wants your eyes to pop out. And there's something in you that wants to respond to that. It, it arouses something in you. That's one of the moments where we need to be able to say, Lord, you, you understand this. You know, you've been here. You know this reaction that I have. It's, it's there. I'm not going to pretty it up. It's what it is, Lord. I, I have to lear, learn how to handle this situation. I mean, how many of you think that way when you're in the middle of a temptation? Or whatever, whatever kind of temptation it is. The Lord is right there. And his love hasn't stopped. He knew what he was getting into when he, went to, when he started to save us. He knew what we were made of. I mean, do we not, are we not encouraged in the book of Hebrews to come to him to a throne of, what is it? Grace. And grace is the help I need. I can't, I'm, I'm already I'm in a situation where, Lord, I'm, this, is, this is just part of my old nature. I've got to have, have to help to handle this. And so what I need is grace. I need divine help. But when do I need it? Well, yeah, I, I guess I phrased that wrong. But the grace is available when? Time of need. But how often do we imagine that I've got to deal with this somehow, and then I can step back in, now we can, okay, it's okay to be with Jesus again. I'll tell you, we've got a Savior who longs to walk with us in our weakest, neediest, dirtiest times, not to leave us there, but to just to give us his, all that he has done for us is meant to be brought to bear on those things and to help us in those times. You know, David, uh, Ben re referred to a lot of these scriptures, a lot of Psalm 139, but you read the whole thing. And I, I'm not going to turn there, but I'll just re remind, remind us of the, uh, the words that there are there. Lord, you have searched me. It begins. It ends with him saying, Lord, search me. But Lord, you have searched me. You know everything about me. There's something about us that wants to pretend things are better than they are. Not just with each other, but with ourselves. We don't, want, we don't like being totally honest with ourselves. It's, it's somehow, like I say, it's, it's not only the mask we put on 
For others, we, we try to believe that. We try to believe, Lord, I'm not all that you say I am. God, I'm better than that. And, and if something happens, you know, I want to suppress that and deny it and go through all of that. You know, I, I was thinking of a song that we have sung. I pulled up the words this morning. Um, the, the ensemble has sung it, and it's about the secret place. Compares our hearts to a house with lots of rooms. And, and you know, one day um, the writer of the song just let the Savior in. So now he's, he's come in to live. But then there's an issue. There is a secret room in there that stays locked. And it stays locked because I've got some stuff in there I don't want anybody to know. I'm ashamed of, what, of, of what's in there. Just stay away from that room. Lord, we're good. You can go anywhere else in the house, but I want you to stay out of that room. And of course in the song, it's one day he goes to that door and he wants in. And, but then, the, then the, uh, the songwriter discovered, hey, it wasn't like I thought it was going to be. I was in such bondage about that room and all the secrets that it held. And he, when he came and he took the key and he went in there, oh, I was so ashamed. But he went in there with love and mercy. And he was able to help clean up that mess. He wasn't put off by it. He loved me, and now I don't have to worry anymore. I'm free. My God, doesn't the Lord want us to be free? Anybody here where the Lord's kind of digging deep and kind of getting close to your secret rooms and mine? We've got, we got a God who longs for us to be authentic all the way through. Where We're not hiding from Him. We're not pretending to ourselves or to anyone else. We can just be we can be his. I tell you, the things that we sing about, the joy, the peace that there is in Christ, that's real. But how many times do we fail to enter in and enjoy it because we're, we're kind of living this bound, oh God, I've got to suppress and, and deny this kind of part of my life. And boy, that could, that could be all kinds of things. It could be sin. It could be stuff that we've hung on to. It could just be fear. It could be guilt. It could be self-will. And of course, if you've got somebody where, where self-will is just a dominating factor in their life, you, got, you, know, you, you come to a point. There are some people that fall into that category that come in and they're religious that they just never really surrendered to begin with. An example of that would be the, uh, the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler genuinely wanted eternal life. He genuinely wanted to obey God's laws. There was a part of him that wanted, to, wanted that, but he also wanted to make a deal with God. He did not want to give up his money, and in the end, that became the most important thing in his life. There was a strong hold of self-will. It just would not yield. But I mean, even when someone genuinely comes to Christ, that's when salvation really begins as a process of God changing me. And it, gets, it can get messy. How many know it can get messy at times? When, when he brings us face to face with things. I'm so glad he doesn't bring everything to my attention at once. Uh, there's stuff that, he, that goes, goes on for years and we wonder why am I this way? Why do I feel this way? Why, do I, why am I not freer than I... Than I than I ought to be, or freer than I, anyway, than I am, I guess, whatever. But, and then he begins to shine the light. But the thing is, what do we do when he begins to do that? Do we close up and deny, or do we take that position that David did? Lord, you know everything about me. Your thoughts are more than the sand by the sea. You know, you know my downsitting, my uprising, you know my thoughts before I say, the words before I say them. All of my days are written in a book before one of them comes to be. David didn't see God's infinite knowledge, complete knowledge of him as a threat. Something to be uncomfortable about. He saw that as something from which he drew great strength and comfort. And I want to come to that place. Do you? I mean, is this, is this connecting with anybody? Is this, uh, is this where we're at? 
in so many ways. God longs to, to just fill every room of our hearts and every area of our lives and to help us with the, with the things that are besetting sins. The things that we just can't overcome and we think I've got to fix it and then he'll receive me instead of saying, God, I'm going to let you in just like it, it's like it is. God, I am a mess. You know, you know all about me. But Jesus, let's just hand in hand, let's go and look at that mess. And we find out when we do that that he's not sitting there like we would. What's the matter with you? That's our attitude sometimes. Instead, he says, yes, I know. I know all about it. I know what, it's, I know what it means to be human. I, I've been here. I've tasted your sorrows. I've tasted your temptations. I know what it's like. I've been here. Oh, God, help us to understand his compassion and his mercy. You know, I was thinking about this. And I believe with all my heart, God longs for us to come into a, a relationship in which there is a balance. Because you can imagine, if you're aware particularly of something that really is a big deal down in here and it's hidden. It's a scary prospect to say, I'm going to just be authentic with him. I'm going to open my heart and say, Lord, this is what it is. Come and let's just look at it and let's deal with it. And, and it's so easy to think that, oh, I'm going to be so obsessed with how bad I am and how much is terribly wrong with me. That's, that's going to, that's, my whole life is going to be about, oh, God, but I'm just picturing this, that what needs to be in the background of every, everything like this is the cross. That needs to loom so big as the, as the backdrop of every encounter we have with the Lord that it will just triumph over everything that is wrong. Because it doesn't matter how dirty, how ugly, the thing that is lurking down somewhere in my heart and in my life that he longs to root out and clean. Yes. The cross is greater. Yes. The cross reveals how he feels about me even then. The cross is not about him giving me laws and me failing to live up to them and, and reaping his justice and his, his judgment. It's about the judgment that I deserve being poured out upon him. It's about, uh, about his love. There's nothing that should assure us of his love in our darkest moment than the cross. Yes. He did that knowing what we are. He went there. He took my sorrows. and every, The worst thing about me, he took it upon himself knowing what he was getting into because he loves me. What am I hiding for? What am I afraid of? Yes. We don't have to be afraid of his love. Nor do we have to be afraid that his provision is not enough. I'll tell you, when he said it's finished, thank God. Thank God the provision for everything that's wrong with me was, was taken care of. And he longs to share his forgiveness, his life, the grace that is greater than sin. To help me, to teach me. Yes, Lord, I fell in the mud again. Help me with this, with this issue. Oh, God, it's a... It's a besetting issue. And he doesn't sit there and say, oh, when are you going to get it, dummy? That's kind of how we react sometimes. In fact, we react that way with ourselves. Well, I mean, who do we think we are? Isn't that why we need a Savior to begin with? Yeah. Oh, my God. When are we going to let him do the saving? And be willing to just open up and say, Lord... Let my life be as transparent before you as, as anything could be. And I want to walk with you every moment of every single day and have you teach me and, and work with me. And so, so that in those moments, right when I have a need, I can turn to you as though you're right there. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to have people you know, have some sort of imaginary thing. This isn't just some sort of uh, mental trick. Or try to have an experience, try to feel something. I'm just talking about the sense that he's there. Whether we feel it or not, and what, whatever else is going on. Is he there or not? He's promised he was. Promised he would be. 
And he wants us to be able in, our, in those moments to be able to come to him and say, Lord, you see what's going on. You see what my, my nature is trying to cry out for. You see how I reacted. And I know that's not how you'd handle it. Lord, show me what's going on. Help me to understand what I need to understand. But help me also to, to believe that your grace is able to help me to react differently to this situation or to that one or have different motivations or whatever the need is. I mean, this covers the gamut of all that's wrong with us. Lord, that situation that hurt me so bad back there, and it's just, it's just festered in my heart, in my life. I'm bitter because you didn't do things the way I wanted you to. Still mad at you. Oh, my God, do we need to humble ourselves and surrender? Yes. Yes. He longs to give peace. He longs to come in and pour in the oil of his grace and his mercy to our hearts. We don't have to carry the burdens of living in this world. We can be free. And where there's forgiveness that's needed, he can give us the power to see people through his eyes. I often have to pray that, Lord, here's how I tend to react to some, such and such a person. I know it isn't right. I know it isn't what you want. But, oh, God, help me to see that person through your eyes. Help me to be patient and loving. Help me to trust you, knowing that you're able to work out the things that I see in their lives. I don't have to fix it. I don't have to pound it into them. I don't have to do all the things that we think we have to do. Boy, is, are, are we something else with, with other people? We treat other people the way we certainly wouldn't want to be treated. <laughs> We're impatient with them and expect them to be patient with us and our, and our faults and failings. I'm so glad that, that he's not a demanding savior in the sense that he demands it from us. What he longs for us is just to come with an honest, open heart as broken as we are, and say, Lord, I am trusting wholly in the cross and what you have done for me. I mean, you can go on and on with this. I just wanted to read something that uh, is a familiar scripture from Psalm 51, because David, David really screwed up, didn't he? Here was this man after God's own heart. Somehow, there was a period of his life when he drifted and he got spiritually insensitive and he fell into a pretty gross sin, didn't he? He committed adultery with a woman, basically arranged for the husband's death, married her, and they had a child. And all of this period of time, he had no clue that he had done some, what he had really done and how God saw it. I'll tell you, that's the fruit of, getting, of not living in his presence. Not really walking with him, becoming careless. But when, but when the Lord shined the light, this is where you see a man after God's own heart. It wasn't somebody who made excuses. It wasn't somebody who, you know, tried to point the finger at somebody else and say it's their fault. He just, he, t he opened his heart. He bared his heart to the Lord. And he said, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Isn't that an awesome thing to be able to, to, be able to look to that as the source of, of our hope? Yeah. Lord, I know you can't look at me and have mercy because of some great thing you see in me. It's because it's your character. It's your nature to love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. You sense this? The heart of someone who's just open to God, who's not trying to hide, not trying to cover up, not trying to do anything except, Lord, this is the way it is. This is it. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. I mean, think of, the, think of this man who had walked with God. 
And this was not just some sort of something he learned in a lecture or in a sermon. This was something that he had walked out for years. He knew that, God, that he had a relationship with God where God could talk to him. Does God ever talk to you? Does he ever speak in a, in a way where you know there's wisdom that's come into your mind in a situation where you're really looking to him? It might be, just be a scripture. But God actually breathes something of his heart into you and there's knowledge, there's wisdom, there's understanding that comes into you about something that you're going through. David had experienced this. And he, and he expresses, Lord, you want truth in the inner part. And part of that is not just a knowledge of what's truth in that sense. This is, you want me to be authentic. You want me to be real down here where I'm not pretending to be something that I'm not really down in my heart. You want me to be a, a server of you all the way through my being. Praise God. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He saw the, the power of God to forgive. Thank God. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's an awesome prayer that we have the right to pray every single day. But isn't it predicated on all that's gone before? Where there's just an utter honesty about ourselves and the real need. We're not pretending. We're just saying, Lord, I'm exactly what you say I am. But I understand even in that moment when I, I see the worst that there is about me, I know you love me. All I have to do is look at the cross and I understand that you love me and you've loved me from the foundation of the world and I can bring, I can, I can come just as I am. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners who will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. <laughs> Interesting how he expresses that. Lord, you open my lips. There's a sense that I, everything I need has to come from him. You see that in, in, that, in that expression? Lord, you, you, were, you act, and I'm, I'm going to be in the position of one who responds to your acting. You open my lips, and I will pray. I will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. And you can go on and read all, I mean, David walked with God. When he was upset, he could talk to God about it, and God didn't get mad at him. But even in those times when he expressed his emotions honestly before God, there was still a sense, God, I'm not mad at you. God, I love you. I trust you. Because the, over, the overriding con, uh, condition of his heart was one of trust. Yes. Lord, I know who you are. I know you love me. I know you're for me. Even though I have all these needs, Lord, I am trusting in you. Lord, you see me. You see everything about me. Search me. Help me. I don't know how else to express it. I just, I sense God's heart toward his people. And I know he sees how much every one of us has hidden struggles. Things that he's trying to deal, he's trying to set us free from. And he longs for us to walk with him and learn from him. And he longs for us to hand the key to our secret place to him. And say, God, I'm not going to hide, I'm not going to pretend. I need you to look inside the darkest corners of my heart and help me. Help me to be honest. Help me to repent where I need to repent. Help me to trust where I need to trust. Help me strengthen my will to, do, to want to do your will. 
Help me with every area because all of it has got to come from your, the power of your salvation. Lord, it's your life that's going to transform me. It's not me. It's not my efforts. But God, I don't want to hide anymore. I want to go through my life and I want to say, Lord, teach me your ways. I want to, I want to feel your heart and I want to see through your eyes. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. So I don't know, I think I've said what I need to say, but if I had to title this, I'll go ahead and do it now. Let him in your secret place. Does that sound like a good thing to be doing? Yes. Anybody here got secret places that we need the Lord to, to look in? I tell you, the further you go, the more you realize how much we, how much we do need down here. And we don't, who are we kidding? I'm so glad that we can have joy and peace in the midst of that. That could be, we can, we can have it because we see beyond the need and we see his provision and we see the hope of his promise. We see his love reaching out and accepting us right where we're at in order to, in order to bring us forward. Not accepting in the sense that oh, I'm okay with your sin, but accepting us as, as needy and, and candidates for his love and for his mercy. So I would just encourage anyone here who's struggling and feeling like you got to earn it, you got to pretend, you got to be this, you got to be something you're not. We need, to, we need to come to the Lord as honestly as we know how. Just start where we're at and say, Lord, I need you. This is where I'm at, but I'm trusting you to do what, for me what I cannot do for myself. I'm not going to hide or pretend, but I know you love me. And I know the cross and the resurrection is greater than anything that could ever be wrong with me. So praise God.